Emotional triage, how do I cope? This is all about dealing with the emotional fallout after being dumped by your child. So today we're gonna talk through the uh, full range of emotions. It's something important for you to understand. Keep in mind that feelings are something you have, not something you are. So emotions that we discussed in the beginning were shock, disbelief, shame, and regret. We spoke briefly about anger, frustration, sadness, and grief, and we went over fear, anxiety, hope, and denial. All of these are part of the shock phase that we went through in uh, the last video. So I did a survey on my YouTube channel a little while back, and about a thousand people responded. And, you know, from from what you guys said as the audience in terms of anger, grief, loneliness, regret, other, which were you suffering most from? By and large, 47% was the vast majority of you said grief is what you're struggling with. So classifications for emotions vary, but the primal emotions found in most research studies include happy, sad, anger, fear, distrust, and surprise. So those are the broad categories. And uh, I will put some visual representations up there for you to see with a link to uh, you know their origin where you can explore more. But we're gonna focus on the lower half of these uh, representations, which are surprise, fear, disgust, and anger, because these are the emotions that you are mostly processing when you are dealing with parental estrangement. So before we get into that, I want to set down some guidelines for effective expression. We need to let the emotions out, but we need to do it safely. And as always, get professional help if you feel like things are spiraling out of control. So here are some safe expression techniques. The number one rule here is to choose a safe and private place to process your emotions. So journaling, writing, or recording, uh, either audio or video to get feelings out are effective tools. Creative arts like painting, pottery, crafting, weaving, knitting, gardening, very effective. Physical activity like singing, dancing, walking, running, or working out can be very effective, and structured venting sessions, either with a therapist or a support group. Now I need to kind of talk about the role of mindfulness and self-care. We did go over this in the last video, but this is a foundational principle that you really need to always carry with you through this process. You need to stay present in the moment as much as possible, and you need to take care of you to help ground yourself while you're coping with these tumultuous emotions. So deep breathing exercises, there are many. There are some that are long and slow, and there are some that are really super fast, like, <laughs> and which may feel funny and look funny on camera, but they are very effective for dealing with intense emotions. And there are others that I invite you to research online. Prayer, meditation, and affirmation. There are so many videos on even just YouTube to guide you through these exercises. And any enjoyable activities that bring you joy and relaxation, like long walks in nature, which I did a lot of and I highly recommend. Pastimes and hobbies that you really enjoy. Outings with friends and family that are still with you. And through this process of dealing with these emotions, you want to acknowledge and name your demons. So you're going to have to summon up the courage to confront your deepest fears and pains around estrangement. This will not be an easy ride. You're gonna to need to face your feelings of failure, rejection, and your loss of identity as a parent. You're gonna basically dig through the garbage. You're gonna name it. You're gonna acknowledge it. You're going to sit with it. And you're going to forgive yourself and others for it. And eventually, you will come to the point where you are able to release it and let it go to the wind. This is essentially the healing process in a nutshell, but it is the path to peace, joy, and love in your life again. And of course, again, seek professional help if you feel like your emotions are spiraling out of control, if your thoughts run to self-harm or suicide or harm of others. 
uh, definitely seek professional help. You are absolutely worth it. And the other thing that we always want to remember through this process is that you need to embrace self-care and forgiveness. I've said it before. I will say it again because it is that important to the process. Bring your self-compassion to every activity toward yourself and toward your estranged child. Nurturing negative emotions can hinder your healing and it can be detrimental to your health. Cultivating forgiveness can pave the way for inner peace and maybe even reconciliation, if not with your child, at least within your own heart. So here are some tools for dealing with these negative emotions. Remember, the good life is a process, not a state of being. Category number one, surprise. This includes shock, disbelief, confusion. Here are some tips with dealing with the unexpected. You absolutely want to give yourself time to adjust to the shock of what's just happened. You want to get support from the people who care about you in this life, the ones who are still with you. You want to communicate your experience to others as much as you are able, as and maybe it's not always comfortable, but get support from others. You want to focus on engaging in healthy behaviors. You know, you want to eat well and sleep well and do what you can to kind of take care of yourself. You need to establish or reestablish routines because when you go through this shock, it can knock you for a loop as soon as you possibly can. You want to get back into some kind of routine that will provide you with some kind of stability so that you can process and move forward. And during this time, you really want to avoid making major life decisions. If you've just been rejected by your child and you're dealing with the shock, you don't want to change your job if you can help it or sell your house or do other major life changes because it, it could just be too much. It could be overwhelming. Okay, let's talk about the category of fear. This includes anxiety, shame, guilt, regret. Here's how you cope with the fear of loss, which is really what estrangement is kind of boils down to. You want to identify your specific fears. What are they? You know, just what are your fears around this estrangement? And recognize that fear can work for you. You want to sit with that fear, you know, invite it in, give it a cup of tea, sit down and let it tell you its story. Sit with the fear. You will find insight in, the, in your fear if you sit with it for a time and just let it play out and say what it needs to say. Definitely, I would look for ways to learn from your hardships and visualize new goals as much as you can as you think through or experience these fears. You have to kind of come around to accepting your failures. This is all part of the fear. In fact, fears are often built around fear of failure and every parent on the planet has failed at some point, at some time, and you know, at something along the way, we all do it. You're not alone and it's better to just recognize your failures and again, sit with them and learn from them and do your best to move on. The next category of emotions would be disgust, and this category includes loathing, outrage, contempt, envy. And I think in this category, really what we're trying to do is resist the seduction of righteous judgment, because that's what leads to disgust. So first of all, you need to notice when those judgmental thoughts pop into your head. It's just so easy to let them in and be all, oh, she did this and he did that. And oh, what a terrible mom or what a terrible daughter. I mean, they just creep right in there and they do nothing but turn you into just, it, they just turn you to negativity and they destroy your life and they eat you from within. So step number one, the most important step is to recognize these when they come in. See them coming, let them go. And remember to breathe, breathe your way through this. Don't let your feelings control your thinking, especially these righteous judgment, disgust type feelings. Don't let them control you. And when you feel that righteous judgment coming in and, you know, you're just starting to feel disgusted with the son or the daughter or the dad or the mom or, or whatever, whoever the family member is, 
try to do the opposite of what you're feeling. See these feelings coming in. You feel like kicking something. Laugh instead. Try to laugh. Try to break the pattern. Try to just become aware of what's happening and see if you can't break the pattern. This is the first step to healing. And as you're breaking your patterns, you want to also try to imagine yourself in your own mindful, healthy, happy life. I know it's hard in the beginning, but if you can just kind of start to envision your life going forward without all of these feelings of disgust, just imagine what that might be like. And of course, talk to somebody you trust about your feelings. That is another way to work through the disgust. So let's talk about anger. Anger is, I think, one that takes a lot of moms by surprise because you're not supposed to be angry at your kids like this. And anger includes rage, annoyance, resentment, cynicism, morbidness. And here are some things you can do to blow off steam when you're alone and you need to, you know, get it out of you. I have 13 tips for you here. Number one is to throw or break something safely at home, like try throwing ice or chopping wood. Number two, scream it out in private at home. You can do it into a pillow, in water, or in your car someplace away from everybody where you're not going to scare <laughs> other people or alarm them. Number three, sing it out. Put on that favorite playlist and sing your freaking heart out. Number four, dance it out. Close the door. Put on your favorite tune. Dance like your life depends on it. Doesn't matter how silly it looks. Just do it. Do a tough workout, number five, so running or cardio or kickboxing or, you know, anything that makes you break a sweat. Number six, composition, so you can journal, scrapbook, write, record, make videos, start a blog, express yourself somewhere. Number seven, create, so you can draw or paint or weave or sculpt or knit or quilt or soul or whatever it is. So, not soul, build something so that just you're creating something from scratch and sometimes that activity can take you out of your anger or be a good way to vent the anger. Number eight, I love this one, rage clean. So just get down and start scrubbing those floors, the sink, the bathtub, anything that really needs it. Rage gardening, number nine, is another one. So just attack those weeds and get them out of your life. Trim the bushes, trim the trees, dig those holes. Just get the anger out that way. Number 10, change your surroundings. So go, go on a vacation, get out of your house, visit a friend, go out for a walk. Number 11, destroy a physical representation of your anger. So rip, shred, or burn something. Number 12, verbalize your anger. This one may sound silly, but it can be helpful. Talk to a photo, a doll, or anything as if it was your child. Just get it out. Number 13, turn it around. I've mentioned this one before. Do the opposite of what you feel like doing. So if you feel like punching something, try hugging someone instead. Now, sometimes you're in situations with other people and you can't deal with your anger the same way as you would alone. So here are some tips for dealing with it when you, you're feeling triggered. So number one, number one rule always, think before you speak. So you need to be aware that the heat of the moment is coming on. Stop, breathe before you say anything. Number two, calmly express your concerns. Just be clear, be non-confrontational. If the other person gets heated, then maybe it's not a good time for a discussion. Number three, take a time out. If triggered, step away from the situation to gather your thoughts. Number four, go get some exercise. If you just feel that anger escalating, just excuse yourself and go out for a really brisk walk. Number five, identify possible solutions. So when you perhaps run up against people um, and you just want to complain, don't complain. Maybe offer ideas to solve the problem instead. When you're speaking to someone, stick with those I statements. This is number six. I feel this versus you did that helps you stay out of the <laughs> ever tempting blame game. Number seven, don't hold a grudge. It's hard, I know, but try not to be swallowed up by your own bitterness. You've got to learn to forgive. Number eight, use humor to release tension. 
When all else fails, make a joke, but don't use sarcasm. Sarcasm is easily misunderstood as I have found out on my own channel here, so try to stay away from that one. Number nine, practice relaxation skills. So breathe, say something calming to yourself in your head, you know, get away from the situation, listen to some calming music. And number 10, know when to seek help. If your anger issues are causing you to hurt yourself or others, again, get professional help. This image has been floating around the internet. I love it. This is us with our anger, okay? The story is, a snake wanders into somebody's tool shed, somehow gets entangled with this saw, gets angry about it. Every time he squeezes the saw harder, he only hurts himself and he ends up killing himself because he can't let go of his anger. So let that be a metaphor for yours. And then the next category, which is a big one, is sadness. And this includes grief, pensiveness, numbness, despair. Here are some tips for getting through the really dark days of estrangement. You want to replace overthinking with taking action. So hopelessness gets intensified when we spend a lot of time in our heads. So to combat this, we want to spend a little less time in our thoughts and more in the outside world. So again, what hobby, sport, creative activity could you do to lift your spirits when you're feeling bad? I know it's really hard. I know it sometimes seems hopeless, but once we get going, we begin to feel a little bit better. Make yourself do something constructive. Feelings aren't facts. They're chemical reactions. They come, they go. Uh, just keep that in mind. If you're not sure what to do, anything that distracts you from your negative thoughts is a good start. So that can be as simple as just watching a movie that makes you laugh or listening to music that makes you feel good. And in this estrangement, wherever you can, look for new meaning. You know, just take small steps to follow any positive instinct that flits its way into your head. And this might help you explore how to rebuild your identity after a crisis like this. There's actually a whole school of therapy based on this idea called logotherapy, and it was founded by Viktor Frankl after he survived a Nazi concentration camp. So in these unspeakably inhumane conditions, he kept asking himself how his suffering could somehow help others in the future. And so he survived. He wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning, and this book has inspired millions of people worldwide. Consider too that this difficult experience might actually lead you to something even better and more meaningful than you could have previously imagined. Don't suffer alone. It's tempting to withdraw and time can be healthy, but loneliness and isolation can absolutely make us feel worse. So reach out and lean on others. Find the balance between healing yourself from within and reaching out to others for help without. Mapping your history of loss. Grief is the price we pay for love. Mapping your losses shines a light on unresolved issues that may actually hinder your daily life. So many people are taught to minimize losses, but they can build up like plaque in your arteries. So if you do this exercise that I'm about to show you, you will look at the losses in your life and you'll observe patterns of coping and it will help you deal with any unresolved grief that may be out there and it can help you practice being totally honest with yourself. So I'm gonna show you an example of a loss graph and it starts from in the beginning when you were born, your first memory really is when it begins and it goes through the years up to this year and these are all the losses that one can have in a life. And they can be the loss of a parent, a pet, a loved one. They could be a breakup of a boyfriend or girlfriend. They can be a loss of money, a loss of health, a loss of a job, a loss of a sibling, a loss of a grandparent. Um, you know, they can be any kind of loss. Any, maybe you were forced to move as a child and you didn't want to and you lost all your friends because of it. Any kind of loss is what you put on this graph. And the deeper the line, the deeper the loss in your heart. So mapping things this way 
way is an excellent method for really getting a grip on what you've already lost in life and thinking about how you coped with it and um, just kind of acknowledging it and putting the whole estrangement into perspective because when we do this, we realize, oh, you know, grief and, grief and loss, they go beyond just death. You know, it's grief is that conflicting group of human emotions caused by an end to or a change in a familiar pattern of behavior. So anything can qualify. You can grieve over so many things. You can grieve over moving, losing jobs, losing health, losing money, losing innocence. Any changes in relationships, places, events, and things can all cause feelings of grief. So your homework for this time, if you're serious about healing, is to spend an hour drawing out your loss history graph on paper. And if you're still unclear about how to do this, you can Google this concept and you will probably find lots of ideas for doing it. But definitely draw out that whole history of losses to help put your parental estrangement loss into perspective and just help you further understand your grieving in life. And then number two, I want you to remember to be thankful for something every single day. Just spend five minutes. That's all I ask. It can be simple as the air you breathe or the sunlight outside. If you're really depressed and you're having a hard time being grateful for anything, just spend five minutes being grateful for anything every day. And as a reminder, I am not a therapist. I am just a mom who has gone through this process of moving from heartbreak to healing. And I'm sharing my experiences for anyone who might be interested. So next time, we're going to talk about reflection, deep reflection. What's a good way to reflect with an emphasis on what can I control and what I can't control? I'll see you there.